traffic in fiction, I do not traffic in voice. Although I'll admit that the distinction is a nice one, and perhaps not easy for the lineman to make. With fiction, with art, with writing, it's important that even if you're dealing with areas of complete outrageous fantasy, that there is an emotional resonance. It is important that a story ring true upon a human level, even if it never happened. Born in Northampton in 1953, I started life in an area known as the Burrows. This was the oldest area of Northampton and uh, also the poorest. It was where the rural families who'd been drafted in to the towns to man the conveyor belts of the Industrial Revolution ended up. It had originally been the system of moats and forts that surrounded Northampton's castle before it was demolished. So. All of the streets had names like Moat Place or Fort Street or Dungeon Alley or whatever. And uh, this was a, a quite bleak, grim, monochrome area. Uh, there were a great many families who were probably looking back incest families where even the dog had the same hair lip. I found myself surrounded by a monochrome world of limited opportunities. The only window out of that restricting world was the Tales of Mythology that I would read, or the bright four-colour superhero stories, adventures of people who had no restrictions, people who could fly over the housetops, people who could become invisible. This was a very important key to a very important door. It opened vistas of the imagination with which I was eventually able to transcend and escape the limitations of my origins. Now comics were something that I'd been reading for as long as I could remember being able to read. They were almost a staple part of working class existence. Uh, they were something like rickets. They were just something that you had. Uh, I'd originally read most of the, the British comics, which mainly featured working class children in working class environments, um, generally being spanked by their parents or teacher, which was a peculiar fixation of the British comics of my boyhood. And pretty much they presented a world that was almost indistinguishable from the one that I lived in and thus I didn't find it the most exotic world into which I could escape. However, when I was seven I picked up my very first American comics. These were bright, garish, four-colour things that rather than taking place against some anonymous northern British backdrop took place in cities like New York, which to me were as exotic as Mars. The idea of buildings of that scale, the idea of this modernness 
that seemed to pervade everything. This was a futuristic science fiction world. And then, against that backdrop, you had these incredibly colourful characters who had these amazing powers who could transcend their human limits. I'd already been attracted to mythology, fairy stories, anything which had people that could fly or become invisible or could lift huge mountains or could perform any of these heroic acts for which gods and heroes are largely famous. And so having discovered the American superhero books it was a fairly natural transition. Here was something where I didn't have to read the same myths over and over again but where every month I could read something new about Superman or The Flash. This became a preoccupation. At first I was probably preoccupied with the characters themselves. I wanted to know what Batman was doing this month. Around about the time when I reached the age of say 12, perhaps a little earlier, I became more interested in what the artists and writers were doing that month. It had finally occurred to me that these stories weren't just drawing themselves, that somebody was drawing them, somebody was writing them, and I became fairly knowledgeable in the styles of the different artists. I became critically able to distinguish between a good story and a bad story, and comic books were still very much a part of my life, I mean, which was, in physical terms, was changing quite rapidly, as it would for anybody at that age. I'd moved from my primary school in the working class area into which I was born to a grammar school. Now, call me naive, but entering grammar school was the very first time that I actually realised that middle class people existed. Prior to that, I'd thought that there was just my family and people like them and the Queen. I had really not been aware that there was a whole strata of humanity in between those two positions. When I got to grammar school, I realised that I was one of the very few working class people there because of the 11 plus system and its rigours and that a lot of the other children there had had the advantage of probably a better education than I'd been privy to. Thus, from being a star pupil at my primary school, from being top of the class every year, and from being made head prefect with a little green enamel badge, I suddenly plummeted to 19th in the class, which was a tremendous blow to my already insufferably huge ego. I don't think I ever quite got over that. Certainly by the next term I was 25th in the class. I think for the next couple of years I was second from bottom. I'd finally come to the realisation that I was not going to cut it in the kind of academic world that was spread out in front of me. I decided, pretty typically for me, that if I couldn't win then I wasn't going to play. I was always one of those sulky children who sort of couldn't stand to lose at Monopoly, Cluedo, anything. So I decided that um, I really wanted no more of the struggle for academic supremacy or anything of that nature. After having been expelled from school at the age of 17, I found that my horizons rapidly contracted. The headmaster um, who had dealt with my expulsion had, I think, taken me rather personally. He 